So I'm listening to some music and a fellow comes over and tells me, cardio is worthless and you can't build muscle, you can't lose weight, it's an advertisement. But then I think, well, really? Because I think of someone like Justin Gatlin, who has been to the Olympics four times, and man, that guy does some serious cardio, <laughs> and he's looking great, yeah? And so... When I think of, okay, which one's right? Is cardio worthless? Or can we lose weight with cardio? And, and I think I can answer that question. But we have to go through some metabolic uh, study here, but we'll get there. Um, let's look at how food enters our body. as carbohydrates, you know, starch, pasta, potatoes. We're going to break that into glucose, small chain molecules, and there's our fuel. Or we eat fats that are mostly in the form of triglycerides. And we're going to break those into fatty acids, small chains. Or we can do proteins, which are broken into amino acids. Same story here. All right, carbohydrates tend to be the most efficient. But some people like to try to burn fats, and, and that can work too. Let's take a look at that. Carbohydrates. All right, here's a lot of words, but, but let's look at some basics here. When we eat some monosaccharides, uh, like simple sugars, fructose, galactose, glucose, they're going to cause a spike in our uh, blood sugar called hyperglycemia. Hyper, that makes sense. But if we don't eat something with that sweet meal, we're going to crash. We're going to get tired and grouchy. Hypoglycemia. Now, this can happen with diet or with people who have uh, maybe insulin resistance or diabetes. But the cool thing is our body knows what to do. All right, look at this. I like this chart because let's say we have a lot of sugar. Hyperglycemia. The pancreas does some talking. It says, hey, we're going to dump all this extra sugar into the muscles and the liver. And the language it uses is insulin. Okay, so now we have muscles and the liver with, with uh, glucose, but glucose is big. We're going to compress it down to glycogen. And we're going to keep it there until we need it. So let's say now we've missed lunch. Okay, we've missed lunch, and we're getting hypoglycemia. We're getting tired. Pancreas does some talking, this time with a glucagon hormone. It's going to say, hey, liver, muscles, remember all that sugar that you guys picked up a while ago? We need that in the bloodstream. And so glucagon hormone is going to cause glycogen, a lot of Gs here, huh? G, 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 to release glucose in the bloodstream. The goal is reached, normal glucose levels. All right. Now... It's a large molecule I mentioned, and so we compress it. And this is a problem in healthcare sometimes. If you have a patient who's, let's say, like 80 pounds, and she's 90 year old, and and she can't recover from a sickness, and it kind of makes sense because the muscle tissue is a major reservoir for glucose that's compressed in the form of glycogen. And so someone without much muscle mass is going to have a difficult time maintaining the blood sugar. Uh, I know the liver it, you know, does a lot of the workload, but the liver needs help. So muscle mass is important for maintaining blood sugars. It's not just about looking good in the mirror. Having muscles affects our overall health. All right, I talked a little bit about monosaccharides, disaccharides, but let's dive into this idea of ketones. That doesn't involve sugars or glucose at, uh, or carbs at all. Ketosis is a way we can use fats. I mentioned they mostly come as triglycerides in our, in our food. And we're going to tear that big fat molecule. It has a glycerol head and fatty acid tail. And this is what our membranes are made of, by the way. In fact, we have fats throughout our body that we, we would die without. Okay, so fats, fats are not bad, you know. 
But anyway, so we're going to use that glycerol and we're going to make ketones, which one cool thing about ketones that I like is that fats cannot go to the, the brain. They can't claw across the blood brain barrier like glucose does. Glucose goes everywhere, muscles, kidney, it doesn't matter. But by converting a, a triglyceride into a ketone, the ketones can pass the blood brain barrier and, and energize us. And so this ketogenesis, which means the uh, formation of ketones, is a real thing. It, it can work. But the problem is it only kicks in when you're down to about 20 to 50 grams of carbs a day. And man, who can survive off of that? That's, that's a hard way to be. Um, because we are built in, to um, process carbs. It's very efficient. All right, ketoacidosis. All right, we don't see this too often unless um, prolonged starvation, severe diabetes type 1 usually, or excessive alcohol consumption. All right, okay, so if you're dieting with a ketonic um, sort of way of eating, you're okay. Your ketone levels are fine. But excessive ketosis leads to ketoacidosis. And we don't have a lot of tolerance when it comes to our pH, the blood. We need to be right around, you know, 3.6, 3.5, uh, excuse me, 7.35 to 7.45. That's a healthy range right there. If we drop even just a small amount, 7.2, we're in ketoacidosis. And these numbers are important because maybe someday you'll have a grandmother and the doctor will say, oh, okay, she's got you know pH of blood around 7.25, and, and then you know, oh my gosh, okay, this is a serious condition. I have Halle Berry here, famous actress who is uh, has diabetes, and you know what? She became strong because diabetes taught her how to laugh at her obstacles. All right, we all suffer from something, right? You might think someone's normal, but you find out they're really they're battling some kind of disease. Okay, ATP. ATP is the way we can function because glucose is too big. Okay, see this big glucose molecule? Six carbons. Way too big to get into the cell and do its job. And so we have to break it down. And we're going to break it down into steps. First step is splitting of the sugar glycolysis. Now there's no oxygen used in this and, and later on that becomes important. So I'm just going to move along. So six carbon down to three carbon. Why are we doing this? We want to make ATP. All right, Glucose is cool but we can't function on glucose. We need something smaller. Okay we have the pyruvate and okay, here's this big complicated diagram, but the story is quite simple. We broke glucose down to pyruvate. We got two ATP. That's not much, okay. And now we're going to send that pyruvate into this uh, citric acid cycle, and we're going to squeeze some ATP out of it. And the value of ATP is it's like a battery, all right. When you're exercising, you're expending ATP, but as you expend it, then you drop down into ADP. That's low energy. It's like a dead battery. And that's why we eat, okay? We eat so that we can convert ADP back to ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And if we don't do that, our body starts to get cold because the mitochondria where this occurs, it's in the cell, it's kind of leaky, okay? And so this reaction helps us to keep our body temperature 98.6 roughly. If you stop eating long enough, then your temperature drops and you'll die eventually. Okay. So this reaction also releases heat, carbon dioxide. So we're converting a sugar glucose into a gas, heat, and energy. It works really well. In fact, it works so well that um, we can get 30 to 36 ATP when we do the full reaction, when there's oxygen. 
there's that huge glucose. There's step one, pyruvate. Step two with oxygen in the mitochondria. So for one glucose, we get a whopping 30 to 36 ATP. That's impressive, all right? This is oxidative phosphorylation. Now, if we don't have oxygen, and you might think, well, how can I go without oxygen, man? Well, we do. When we're in intensively working out, we go into oxygen debt. And we don't just collapse. Well, hopefully we don't. <laughs> Some distance runners will. But uh, we switch pathways. We go from aerobic, and we start our sprint. We're in the middle of our sprint. We go anaerobic, oxygen debt. But we keep going. But we're burning a lot of uh, uh, glucose. All right, so you can sprint and get like 600 to 1,000 uh, calories burned in 30 minutes. Or you can stand around and talk about whatever, powders or injections, and only burn 20 to 40. All right, so we got to move. That's If you want to lose weight and get strong, you got to move. Here's that summary, but I'm going to build on it, okay? So, glucose. First step, glycolysis. Second step, aerobic. Excuse me, aerobic here. And 30 to 36. I wrote it here for you. Very efficient. Because look at for one glucose, you're getting 30 to 36 ATP, man. You can do a lot of work with that much. So you're walking, you maybe light jogging. Okay. But if you're doing intensive cardio, for one glucose, you're only going to get two ATP. So here's the word. I highlighted it. Inefficient. But man, you can burn a lot of calories. Alright, so getting back to that question, is cardio worthless? Well, we can look back at Justin Gatlin because Justin Gatlin, he does this anaerobic fermentation, which produces waste products. But Justin doesn't. It doesn't look like cardio is hurting him at all. He's strong and powerful, and here he is in Tokyo, 2021, tearing it up, man. There he is, Justin Gatlin. He's almost age, age, almost age 40 when he does this in Tokyo. Okay. So, yes, cardio, good stuff. Okay, yeast and bacteria, they can make alcohol instead of lactic acid. Our bodies, one of the waste products is lactic acid. So, if you wake up with sore muscles, then you know that yesterday you went anaerobic. You did an intensive workout so hard that you generated lactic acid in your muscles. Yeah, thanks for listening.